gone to Beijing after the Tiananmen Square protests were well underway, that whole event, which it should be remembered, was not just in Beijing, but reportedly in 350 other cities of China. Similar protests were going on, but they were not planned. They were not prepared. There was no strategic decision. There was no advanced decision how long you stay in the square and when you leave. What became very clear to me in retrospect was that the students in the square were operating with great commitment and bravery, but they really didn't know what the hell they were doing. The students had no plan. They were improvising all the way through. And later on, we know that many of those Chinese people who were out in the streets to block there in another day were shot and killed. The attitude that you simply improvise and that the improvisation will bring you greater success is nonsense. It's actually the opposite, that if you don't know what you're doing, you're likely to get into big trouble. I'd never grown orchids before. I had driven down to Manhattan to see some friends of mine I had known when they were at Harvard. And uh, near their house, there was a flower shop. And they had some quite large potted plants of Cattleya orchids. So I bought two or three of those. They survived for a while, they bloomed for a while, but of course they soon died, but I, that led me to inquire about other ones and learning more about how you really take care of them and how difficult some of them can be and how easy some of them are. They take quite a bit of work. That became very important because it was something I could treat as they needed to be treated. And not expecting miracles, but if you don't treat orchids right or anything else in life, then it's not going to thrive. I went to Budapest at the request of the International Republican Institute, which was providing support to the, to the Serbian opposition movement. And one particular part of that opposition movement was uppor. Uh, that's a Serbian word for resistance. He's a retired colonel and he has this type of the military approach and you know the way it speaks. It's really something that, you know, creates a strange impression with, uh, with a bunch of students' leaders. We talked for a while, and I said, well, something missing here. Uh, we haven't talked about who's the, le who's the leader of this organization. Who is the leader? And this one guy says, we don't have a leader. And I said, well, well, wait a minute, guys. I did not fall off the turnip truck coming over here. Somebody has to lead an organization that has mobilized the entire Serbian society. There has to be a leader to that organization. There has to be a leader who's coordinating all these demonstrations. There has to be a leadership that's getting millions of dollars in funding. And they started sort of laughing. So we spent probably one hour fooling him about some stuff. And the reason for this was that we were not very comfortable about giving the details about the organization to the, to the foreigner. 
And then they explained to me, you know, why there's no, quote, leader. It's because to keep it away from the government. The government doesn't know who's in charge. And I later found out I was talking to the leader, <laughs> Sergei Popovich. When Bob Halvey gave us the Gene Sharps of politics of nonviolent action, we were quite amazed. Partly I was, I was ashamed that I didn't know about such a book before, even if there was a translation of Fragmentation to Democracy in Serbian, but I never, I've never seen it. And seeing the knowledge of how power operates and how pillars of the support operate, and all of this stuff we needed to learn hard way throughout our experience, uh, written systematically in one place was a quite an amazing thing. And from that moment I know I will, uh, I knew I, I will read it, even if it was uh, quite a fat book, but, uh, but uh, I didn't know how much it can influence the way we think, and also, also I didn't know, know how useful it will be in developing our own, our own future trainings. It's obvious that we are the majority. If we can just recognize all of those who are against Milosevic by, you know, saluting each other with a fist, he would probably be over within a few years. Atomization is when you the regime attempts to make every individual in the society an isolated unit. It's one of the main ways that totalitarian systems seek to control their populations, make them all fear of each other, for fearing to speak out and to act together, never telling a neighbor or even sometimes a family member what you really think. And that's why it's so important that you begin with these very, very low risk activities so that people can put their foot forward for the first time, put their toe in the water of revolutionary change. That's the foundation that we work on is changing the obedience patterns, moving the obedience to a willing obedience rather than a coerced obedience. By seeing the example of the demonstration of bravery, by other people. Now it's we. Now it's we. And we can do something that I alone could not do. During the 96, 97, we were walking day after day after day, and the police was blocking streets, and our numbers were start falling because it was obviously too boring for the people to demonstrate every day in a harsh winter. So we said, okay, why won't we go home and try to make noise from our balcony? So we start hitting pots and pans, and they spread like fire throughout the Belgrade and other cities, and radio stations were, you know, transmitted. Oh, it is very loud in this neighborhood. Oh, these people are using the loudspeakers. Oh, there is a disco club joining the protest. And we were doing it from 7.30 to 8 p.m. as a response to the state TV news. That was the answer of the This is what, we, we, we don't watch your crap. We do our own thing. From the pots and pans to doing the stickers, so the stickers can be doing every building. And also the things like, you know, will you go prosecute the kids for wearing Otpar t-shirts when there is not one single law which bans wearing anything on a t-shirt? So for the policemen getting inside the high schools 
and arresting high school kids only because they were wearing the t-shirt and then going home and talking to their wife whose friend was complaining because her son was arrested having a dialogue with your kid who is coming now from his school where nobody wants to spend time with him or her because their father is you know beating kids from my neighborhood and now you know this systemic oppression doesn't work these pillars are holding up the government like my fingers are holding up this book and i develop a strategy to undermine each of those pillars the police the the uh, the sangha or the religious institutions, the workers, whatever, every organization, and as they weaken and start to collapse, the government will collapse when those pillars are broken. Ideally, we want those pillars not destroyed, but transferred over to the democratic movement. If you want these pillars to shift sides, you need to co-opt people. You can co-opt people by two means. If you put a price on what they are doing for the sake of the regime, or give them the clear message that there will be a place for them in the future society. This is exactly what Otpor was done. We were telling the police that we are the both victims of the same system. They are pushed to do things they would like to do. We are pushed to the streets instead of sitting in the classrooms. There is no reason to have war between victims and victims. One war, one victims wear blue uniforms, other victims wear blue jeans, but there is no reason for this conflict. And this, this worked, really worked. And it worked in Georgia, it worked in Ukraine, it worked in many other places in the world. This is the way you do. You go and co-opt from discursive pillars. You don't throw stones to the police. There many people in conflict situations that really would like to use violence, but they, their opponents really have more military weapons and weapons of violence, which are usually physical weapons, than the resi potential resistors have. So if the resistors choose to fight with violence, their opponent has all the advantages in that situation because you're choosing to fight with your opponent's best weapons but you can choose to fight with a totally different kind of weapon than these nonviolent forms, which are much more difficult for the opponent to counteract. It's very difficult to build a nonviolent march because what you need is only one agent provocateur or only one lunatic or drunk person throwing stone at the police. So my question is, you have 20,000 peaceful demonstrators, you have one idiot breaking out the window, and these people got all of the media attention. So this is the message which can efficiently undermine your movement. Big concentration tactics are very difficult to control. So what we were dealing with is like you, you would always, you go on the march and there is a risk of the, of the people getting arrested. So what would you normally do? Instead of putting the big guys in front, you will put, you will put the girls in front. You will put the grandmas in front. You will put the military veterans in front. So the police is now faced with the friendly faces. these people are actually carrying the flowers and the banners and smiling. So you make the situation less threatening, so you make the, the possibility of the outcome really smaller. October the 5th uh, should be seen in a context of a successful strategy, and that was not the day like many spectators of media like CNN, they just see this big bunch of people, revolution, boom, and it's over. It was, first of all, 10 years of attempts and failures, and two years of existence of Otpor, five different campaigns. And we were setting the victory on the elections. We knew that Milosevic will lose, and we knew that he will not accept the fact that he has lost. So there was this 
10 days of increasing pressure. That was very important because uh, not only we brought all the country to the standstill, including the general strike, sufficiently dragged down the 70% of electrical power. And if you look to the genes mechanisms, this is called a non-violent coercion. So first you try to convert somebody, then you try to accommodate somebody, and then you go to the coercion. In non-violent coercion, your opponent, in this case Milosevic, was ready to continue the struggle. In fact, orders were given to the police to react against the people. But people were not responding to these orders because the policemen will know that if they shoot into the crowd of hundreds of thousands of people, including their own kids, they will go down to the sink together with Milosevic. They didn't want that to happen. But this is why this preparation period was so important because throughout this period, after victory in the elections and generally strike, we successfully explained to the people in the police and in the military that it is not, again, government against the opposition, but this is the people as whole Serbian people against Milosevic. So around 3 p.m. you had like two to 300,000 people on this square and there was a non-violent takeover of the physically of this building. This is where the people who broke into the building at the October the 5th found many leaflets pre-marked for Milosevic. So this is where we, you know, actually the physical cheat was taking place in the second floor of this building. like symbolic takeover because what was the real takeover was that Milosevic lost power that day because police disobeyed because he ordered the military to get from the barracks after 3 p.m. and they disobeyed this is where he lost the power what you were looking on the TV and physical overtaking of the building was just the symbol of him losing authority that day I think what we learn from Bob and what comes and derives from Gene Sharp thinking and, and writing influenced the way we think and also made our struggle more efficient in a very important point when we were preparing for a decisive struggle. And yes, I think what Bob and, and Gene are doing is uh, precious around the world. And, and we strongly believe that the nonviolent revolutions cannot be exported or imported, but the knowledge on how to successfully implement nonviolent struggle can and is transferred from one group to another as we speak. Well, I felt good that here was a revolution that occurred nonviolently there was no violence on the part of the democratic opposition. And it shows that what Gene was talking about year after year after year, there are realistic alternatives to violent conflict.
Well, I mean, after Serbia, we were we were working with Georgians and Ukrainians and and, and Lebanese and Maldivians and and Iranians and Zimbabweans and Colombians and Guatemalans and West Papuans and the groups from places in the world I couldn't literally find on the map. إذا كرفت ما تزعل عندك صعب ونتقرفنا. بعد عشرين سنة بدون تغيير الموضوع ما هي عاوز ليه ودعي 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 وعصر 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 لكن النتيجة تعجبك كيفنا انتاج محلي من اجل مستقبل السودان Then from Serbia the news spread to Georgia which is under a very repressive regime and then to Ukraine which again had problems and it spread there and then to a series of other countries in the in the stands of the southern tier of the former Soviet Union В цих таких протестних середовищах панували доволі різні настрої, зокрема були люди, які готові були до такого силового протистояння. Книжка, про яку йдеться, це книжка, книжка Джина Шарпа «Від диктатури до, до демократії». І головна думка цієї книжки про те, що з диктатурою слід боротися не насильницькими засобами, була дуже близькою нам. І це, власне, головна думка, яка сформувала десь протести, які вилилися в 2004 році в помаранчеву революцію. Я думаю, що навіть безпосередньо з книжкою, з ідеями Джина Шарпа було знайомлено десь може, десятки тисяч людей. А з ідеями, можливо, навіть не розуміючи, що це ідея Джина Шарпа, і цими ідеями заразилися вже сотні тисяч людей, учасників помаранчевої революції. Якщо говорити про його ідеї, навіть якщо люди не знають, що це власне ідея Джина Шарпа, то я думаю, вони є дуже поширеними і дуже впливовими у світі. Юшенко! 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 They've been waiting for this. They've been waiting for this knowledge. And Jean provided it. How did it feel watching your work spread? Oh, that spread was really quite remarkable. I, I was thinking, I'm still amazed. I'm still amazed. This, this piece, which I regard as very introductory, I think it was maybe 70 or 80 pages to take off like that, 
was a confirmation that the analysis was more or less accurate. They didn't spread because of good propaganda or some sales pitch. It spread because few people found it usable. They found it important. I've worked with uh, some people in Venezuela. I've worked with some people from Zimbabwe. I've worked with people uh, from Iraq, Iran, uh, Tibetans, and possibly a few others. And in most of that work, uh, I was promoting basically Gene Sharp's work and uh, the idea of strategic planning. <laughs> 